organized into the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. We are holding a freedom registration drive throughout the state, encouraging every Negro and white who wants a stake in his political future to prove it by getting his name on a freedom registration book. The word came down from the office in Jackson that, all right, this has got to be the priority. Bob Moses said, we, we, gotta, we gotta really concentrate on this. We've gotta sign people up for the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. We were gonna go to Atlantic City with a delegation of black Mississippians to challenge the white delegation at the Democratic National Convention. Our case was pure and unadulterated exclusion and discrimination. We regarded the delegation sent from Mississippi, an all-white delegation, as illegitimate under the rules of the Democratic Party. And uh, we argued that our integrated delegation from all the counties uh, in the state should be seated instead. students help us get people registered. We registered thousands. I guess people were just fed up. They, people were hunting you to register to vote. You didn't have to just go to their house. They wanted to put their name on. Any place people congregated, we're there with our forms. It wasn't complicated like the official voter registration form and it was confidential. It wasn't going to pass through the hands of the white people down at the courthouse. We have scheduled precinct meetings and district caucuses. And on August 6th, here in Jackson, we will hold our state convention. At that time, we will elect a slate of delegates to the national convention in Atlantic City. <laughs> Delegates came from all over the state. Most of the delegates had never taken part in anything like this in their lifetime. I was happy, really, really, because I did not think I would be a delegate. I didn't. And uh, I was one of the first ones that they selected. It was a wonderful experience to see these people who had been oppressed and uh, killed and for trying to register to vote, taking over uh, their own um, destiny for the first time, doing something that I think they'd never imagined being able to do. Will the delegates please be seated? The state convention for the Freedom Democratic Party is now in session. Out of 68 people in the delegation, four were white. The regular delegation was all white, had no blacks. So we are integrated at that point, and they are not. Joseph Rao agrees to be the uh, chief counsel for the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Rao was a Washington insider from way back in the 40s, and he had worked with all sorts of liberal causes and politicians. He was a lawyer for United Auto Workers, was very powerful. And that's a great person to have on your side. Mr. Rao, what is your dispute with the regular Mississippi Democratic delegation? Very simple. They are disloyal to the National Party. They exclude Negroes who would help the National Party from their roles. They have uh, engaged in the terroristic activities in Mississippi. The people in Mississippi didn't know how national politics worked. They didn't know how conventions worked. Rao did, and he was the one who said that, I think we can do this.
I can't overstate how seriously Johnson took this whole thing. He believed that Bobby Kennedy, who was then Attorney General, was going to use any disruption at the convention as a vehicle to displace him as the nominee. The second thing he was concerned about is he uh, wanted to keep the regular southern wing of the party in the party, that that whole battle would cause a split within the party, which would drive out the regular southern states. And he believed that without the South support, he would lose the election. So I was uh, designated to go to the convention as a delegate to make sure that did not happen. We had Democratic congressmen from Illinois and from other states. The Democratic Party was the party of Adam Clayton Powell. So we, we felt we had uh, an inroad there. If they let us state our case, we would be we would be seated. Get on board, children, children, get on board, children, children, get on board, children, children. Let's fight the human rights. I hear those moms howling and coming from the square. Blankets to speed up fighters, but we're gonna leave them there. Get on board, children, children, get on board, children, children, get on board, children, children, and let's fight the human rights. I think that trip must have taken, uh, I guess, 20 hours. I'm not sure. It was a long trip. But the mood on the bus was upbeat. Here we are going to Atlantic City to uh, unseat uh, the people who had denied us the right to vote. So it was really a, a jubilant time to me. We stepped out into a new world. On Monday, the 1964 Democratic National Convention will open here in Atlantic City, a resort 100 miles south of New York. The job will be to nominate President Lyndon B. Johnson as the man to take on Senator Barry Goldwater in the presidential election battle in November. Known as Convention City and home of the Miss America contest, Atlantic City can now claim the honor of a national political convention. These people were beauticians and farmers and uh, mechanics, and they had kind of baggy, worn suits and funny-looking dresses in some cases. Uh, they, they weren't slick like the rest of the delegates were, so people w weren't qu quite sure what to make of these people. We believe that we will be seated in this convention because it is right. When you tell the truth, you don't have anything to hide. Outside the convention hall, we had a vigil, went on 24 hours every day that the convention was in session. It was, you know, great for us who'd spent time in Mississippi to see not only people from Mississippi there and not only volunteers there, but larger groups of people who came from all over to support the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. I know the boardwalk was covered with people. I think it was hard to walk down the boardwalk because there were so many of us. Go call it on the The whole notion of the demonstration out on the boardwalk and the MFDP challenge was all by way of trying to use the attention that would be focused on the convention to say to the country, look at Mississippi, look at what is going on there. You cannot allow this to continue. We 
had to go to the delegations from the various states to make a case that had never been made before, that an official delegation uh, that came from a state should not be recognized, and an entire challenge delegation should be recognized in its place. They were very confident coming to the convention. They had every reason to be confident. The Mississippi Freedom Party had morality on their side, which is a powerful force in politics. So this was a revolution that they were starting within the Democratic Party. Mr. Rao, when will the fight come and how? Well, the fight comes this way. On Saturday afternoon, there will be a hearing before the Credentials Committee, and we will present our case. This was before the convention actually formally met. These 108 people would listen to the Freedom Democrats. Then if 11, only 11 members of that committee would file a minority report, that would mean that it would go to the convention floor in front of a national television audience why the Freedom Democrats would win because their case, of course, was so strong. Are you hoping that President Johnson will come out on the side of your party? No, I think that'd be a mistake. I think it would be a mistake for the president to take sides, even our side. All we ask for is benevolent neutrality, by which I mean real, honest-to-goodness neutrality. I don't know how anybody can stop uh, what they're doing on the Freedom Party. I think it's very bad, and I wish that I could stop it. I tried, but I haven't been able to. Last night, I couldn't sleep. By 2.30, I waked up. Lyndon Johnson literally was so fearful that the convention was going to blow up that he essentially went to bed for two or three days and had what amounted to a, a nervous breakdown. He told his closest advisors and his closest friends that he was going to quit, that he couldn't take the pressure. I do not believe I can physically and mentally uh, carry the responsibilities of the the world and the, the neighbors and the, the South. And I thought about it a good deal this morning. The testimony before the Credentials Committee, the FDP had a lineup of very different people. They had Rita Schwerner, the widow of Mickey, who had been killed in Neshoba County. They had Martin Luther King, everybody knew King. The seating of the delegation from the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party has political and moral significance far beyond the borders of Mississippi or the halls of this convention. But the highlight of the testimony was that of Fannie Lou Hamer. The sharecropper who had been evicted from her plantation had come to s symbolize the Mississippi movement. Mr. Chairman, and to the Credentials Committee. It was the 31st of August in 1962 that 18 of us traveled 26 miles to the county courthouse in Indianola to try to register to become first-class citizens. We was met in Indianola with, by policemen. The president, Lyndon Johnson, he's not <laughs> afraid of Martin Luther King's testimony, he's afraid of Fannie Lou Hamer's testimony. And so he decides that the country should not see her testify live. Johnson is in the White House, and he convened an impromptu press conference. We will return to this scene in Atlantic City, but now we switch to the White House and NBC's Robert Goralski. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. On this day, nine months ago, he did it knowing that they would break away, thinking he might announce who his choice of vice president was going to be. Instead, he gets up there and he announces, get this, he announces that it's nine months to the day since, since Governor Connolly, who was there, was shot along with President Kennedy. So he announced a nine-month anniversary. Everybody's scratching their heads. Thank you very much. And then he leaves. And by that time, Annie Lou Hamer's testimony was over. 
However, it backfired on Johnson because it became a story that she had been taken off television and in the news that night and for, for days afterwards, they replayed her testimony. I was carried to the county jail and put in the booking room. They left some of the people in the booking room and began to place us in fail. She had Mississippi in her bones. Martin Luther King or the SNCC field secretaries, uh, they couldn't do what Fannie Lou Hamer did. They couldn't be a sharecropper and express what it meant, right? And that's what Fannie Lou Hamer um, did. And it wasn't too long before three white men came to my cell. One of these men was a state highway patrol. He said, we're going to make you wish you were dead. I was, I was in Mississippi watching it on television with local people. This was a transformative uh, moment for the folks in that room. This was the first time that they ever had seen one of their own, a black Mississippian who they all knew, first of all, on television, secondly, um, standing up for their rights. I began to scream and one white man got up and began to beat me in my head and tell me to hush. One you listen to Mrs. Hamer and you're absolutely convinced that there's absolutely no justification for seating this all-white delegation. And if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to speak with our telephones off of the hook because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America? Thank you. That testimony offered in public session last Saturday, we are told, had the greatest impact on the women members of the Credentials Committee, and it is from among them that a sufficient number has been found to make a minority report possible. The Freedom Democratic Party has done everything in its power, as I listen to the testimony, to abide by the laws and rules of Mississippi. I think they ought to be seated in this convention. I think they represent about 50% of the population of Mississippi, all the Negroes in Mississippi who are excluded from voting and participation in the regular Democratic Party. And I think certainly they're entitled to representation. There was a lot of sympathy for uh, seating this Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. But once you see that Lyndon Johnson has shut down Mrs. Hamer during her live testimony, it, you can't help but wonder what else is he gonna do? And how are these delegates gonna respond when there's real pressure placed on them? <laughs> Northerners are more upset about this. They stay, call me and right, say that the Negroes have taken over the country. They're running the White House. They're running the, the uh, uh, Democratic Party. Yeah. And they don't understand that. They're there before that television. And they don't understand that nearly every white man in this country would be frightened if he thought the Negroes were going to take him over. People who were on the Credentials Committee who were um, listed as being supportive of the challenge, uh, found that in one case a woman was said, well, your husband isn't going to get that judgeship. There was other pressure applied throughout. So what had appeared to be a certainty became less and less certain. Johnson was using everything he possibly could to keep this challenge at bay. Hubert Humphrey, he was slated to be the vice presidential nominee, and yet Johnson told him, you will not be the, the uh, vice presidential nominee if you can't fix this Mississippi problem. 
he called Walter Ruther, his old friend with the United Auto Workers, and Joe Rao's old friend, sent him to Atlantic City on a red-eye flight to work, and they began to manipulate and pull strings. I don't think neither one of you ought to let anybody know. Just go on and act independently. Don't be acting for Johnson or anybody else. You just act on Ruther and you act on Humphrey. Don't have people saying that I'm making you do this. I never heard of it. Walter Ruther was the chairman of United Auto Workers at that time, certainly one of the most powerful unions in America. And he was Joe Rao's boss. Uh, Joe Rao was the counsel for the United Auto Workers. Ruther came to Rao and made this threat. You either buy this compromise or you're no longer counsel of the UAW. And it worked. I talked to Joe Rao and I said, look, Joe, we've been friends for years. You're our lawyer. And thank God, if you don't work this thing out on a sensible, reasonable basis, then you and I are going to part company because I'm in the president's corner on this thing all the way. Late this afternoon, the compromise offer came, or the compromise announcement came, in a special meeting of the Credentials Committee here in the auditorium. Walter Monvale, who was chairman of the subcommittee that drew it up, gave the details. We recommend that the convention instruct the Democratic National Committee. The compromise that was ultimately reached was we would give them two seats, and the official Mississippi delegation would keep its 68 seats. Someone came in and said, they have offered us a compromise. And at that point, some of us that was there jumped up and said, oh, hell no. We didn't come all the way here to Atlantic City for two seats. We came to unseat them, to come back to Mississippi representing the Democratic Party. Last night, Congressman Adam Clayton Powell of New York City came by our CBS News studios, and I talked with him. You would recommend that they accept that compromise of oh, a yes. delegation? Oh, yes, very definitely. Adam Clayton Powell, he came and telling us that you all got to do this. This is politics. You give and you take, and you, you compromise. The black establishment just couldn't comprehend that this group of people, these sharecroppers, these maids, these small farmers, these people from Mississippi backcountry, would walk away from what these generous white people had offered. They couldn't understand that. Adam Clayton Powell didn't know Fannie Lou. And he walked up to her and he said, you don't know who I am, do you? And she just ran back in her seat and said, yeah, I know who you are. You are Adam Clayton Powell. She said, but how many bales of cotton have you picked? How many beatings have you taken? He couldn't say nothing. Oh, here's a piece of tape made a minute or two ago at the Union Baptist Temple in Atlantic City, a meeting of the Freedom Democratic Party to consider this compromise. The delegates of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party has just voted unanimously to reject the proposal that has been offered by the Credentials Committee. We missed a golden opportunity this country did to say, to come out and show the world what a democracy really should look like and how this country would stand for and protect people who were fighting for the Constitution of the United States of America. They walked us right up to the doorsteps and then slammed the door. The Honorable Lyndon G. Johnson is nominated by acclamation as our The convention went as 
Johnson wanted. He appeared in a great uh, cheers and hurrahs and standing ovations, and he was a happy president of the United States. Hubert Humphrey got rewarded. He was selected as vice president, and that was that. I felt bad that we had not unseated the Mississippi delegation, but Fannie Lou and I came home with the um, feeling that our mission had not ended. We were coming home to continue to fight uh, for the right to vote. We were charged because uh, we had stuff back here to do. Under this act, if any county anywhere in this nation does not want federal intervention, it need only open its polling places to all of its people. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 actually got its birth during Freedom Summer. It was signed in August of 1965, and one of the most important things it did was it abolished literacy tests, and it put voting in seven southern states under federal supervision. And that, above all else, the legacy of Freedom Summer really, really changed American politics. By the end of 1965, 60% of blacks in Mississippi were registered to vote. There's this great pressure within the movement. People saying, well, we did our best, we did the right thing, and it didn't work out. You know, when we were organizers, that was okay. But when we tried to have power, the power rose up and, and knocked us down. After the convention, the movement changes. Um, there's this movement toward black nationalism, which grows in stake. There is just an idea of thinking about what we've been doing and doing something else, something different. When I was leaving Mississippi, I did not want to go. You know, you fall in love with the people. You fall in love with that community, that wholeness that you have when you're working as a part of something that's meaningful. To know that you're just going back to pretty staid life was very, very hard. I hope, sincerely hope that I made some small difference in moving the movement forward in rural Mississippi of lifting the oppression off the necks of people who live there. But I don't have any doubt all these years later that the person who benefited the most from my being in Mississippi was me. I have an experience that's unique among white Americans of an understanding of race that isn't possible to get hardly any other way. The system, the Jim Crow system, had told me to stay in my place. It had told me that you have a role to play in Jim Crow society. Play it well, and I had played it well, along with, so did many other black people. But now Freedom Summer was telling us, you don't have to play that role anymore, folks. You are now on the, the path. It's going to be a tough struggle for children, for adults, for everybody involved in the movement. It's going to be tough. But that, that train has left the station, y'all. Exclusive corporate funding.